This is Tiger Lily Gonzalez, and I just want to share the latest report by the Las Vegas Review Journal regarding Eric Scott. On the third anniversary of the shooting of Eric Scott by Las Vegas police officers at a Northwest Valley Costco, family members are in town to attend a vigil in his memory. Scott, who was 38 at the time, was shot and killed in 2010 at a Summerlin Costco store. Police who had been alerted by a Costco employee that Scott was causing a disturbance and had a gun said when officers arrived and told Scott to surrender, he raised the gun toward them. Scott was shot by Metro officers William Mosier, Joshua Stark, and Thomas Mendiola as he walked out of the store. The shooting was ruled justified, but helped set off an in-depth review of officer-involved shootings. Now, this is a sample of how lamestream media like the Las Vegas Review Journal and others have perpetuated the lies and the agenda of Douglas Gestapo Gillespie, the sheriff for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. Lamestream media's coverage of this tragedy has been extremely biased and very obviously agenda driven. The agenda is anti-gun, pro-government, pro-establishment, pro-cop. The facts do not matter to them. They are there as a mouthpiece to perpetuate the lies invented by Sheriff Douglas Gestapo Gillespie and his entire regime. The following is an excerpt of what really happened as told by the surviving father, William B. Scott, who has authored a book called The Permit. He wrote this book after exhausting every legal means possible to obtain justice for his son. Freedom Rider Radio, where freedom riders, freedom riders freedom. And welcome back to the Roundtable Group here on Freedomizer Radio, www.freedomizerradio.com, with your hosts, Sean Gruber, David Hart, and Jim Dunzing. Sean is uh, out of the studio this evening. David's here with us. We're also being joined uh, on air here by Tiger Lily and uh, Bill Scott. Now, uh, Bill is the father of Eric Scott. It's the Yesterday was the third anniversary of Eric's death. Murder by cop, wouldn't it be? Murder by cop, yeah. And Bill, why don't you uh, why don't you go ahead and tell the story? I guess. Yeah, uh, the short version is uh, Eric was in Costco with his girlfriend shopping, and uh, he was legally carrying a concealed weapon. Costco did not have any signs; they still don't have any signs at the uh, Costco Summerlin place here in Las Vegas. And uh, so he was in the store, accidentally came uncovered when he squatted to uh, check to see if some water bottles would fit into a cooler. Somebody saw it, saw the gun, and even though they talked to him and everything looked pretty cool, one little dirt bag, Shay Lyerly, who was the undercover loss prevention officer, he decided he was going to call the cops, give Eric a little harassment that way. Well, the cops rolled in in force, thinking they had some kind of a horrible, armed, crazy guy barricaded inside. They decided to evacuate the building, didn't tell the customers why. So Eric and his girlfriend walked out quietly with everybody else, not having any idea what was going on. Lyerly pointed out Eric to a cop that was scared to death by the door, Bill Mosier. Mosier was sweating bullets, had his sunglasses on, his hands were shaking, holding his 45, and Eric had already walked past him. So he turned, Mosier panicked, screamed at Eric, gave him three conflicting commands. Eric stopped, turned around, saw this fat little pig uh, holding a gun on him. And before Eric could do anything, Mosier shot him because Eric had a blackberry in his right hand. Mosier thought it was a gun because he was so scared. So the short version is Eric was killed by... uh, and a perfect storm of arrogance, anti-gun uh, fanaticism, and policies by uh, Costco, ostensibly to save their customers. It turned out killing Eric, and uh, you know, bad judgment. Well, that is bad enough. But then after that, they uh, the videotape of right there at the exit, 
that disappears. And they took Eric's gun off his body after the body was already in the ambulance, gun and holster from inside the waistband, put it on the ground. So now you have the gun in the holster on the ground in front of Costco next to Eric's Blackberry and a pool of blood. So then they claim, see, there's proof that Eric pulled his gun out. We had to kill him. No, all that was made up. They later broke into Eric's condo, stole several other more guns in order to say, oh, this guy was a real nutcase. He had a second gun on him. Why did he have to have that? Well, as I explain in this new book, that I hope we get a chance to talk about, Jim, the permit that I wrote. Uh, when they took the gun off of his body, the AMR ambulance EMTs had already started working on their report saying they found the gun on the body. Well, that report could only be accurate if Eric was carrying a second gun because why? Well, the first gun was on the ground because Eric had supposedly pulled it. So they frantically used the public administrator in Clark County, Nevada, to literally break into Eric's condo with a cop, Metro cop in tow, and they stole several guns. One of them was a small Ruger LCP that later showed up at the inquest hearing as, quote, proof that Eric had a second gun on his person. Well, he didn't, never did. So then, as Jim said, the uh, Costco surveillance video magically disappeared. I wonder why. Because Metro, Las Vegas Metro cops, left that video hard disk in Costco's hands for five days. Real police don't do that. They immediately confiscate it, especially when a homicide has happened. But these guys did. And in that time, Costco personnel messed with it, supposedly tried valiantly to recover the damaged video. And, uh, and then the cops decided maybe they ought to pick it up after five days. They sent it to Secret Service in Los Angeles for forensics work. Secret Service came back and said, well, we were able to recover 96% of the data. The only part that was in a damaged sector just happened to be the time that Eric was in the store and just happened to be the time Eric was killed. So a number of you know former cops, one in particular, Mike McDaniel in Texas, he said this whole thing stank from the start. So he, as a former professional cop, started doing analysis on this. And I've since been in contact with him. And he read the entire Las Vegas Metro uh, police report, investigation report, all 1,472 pages of incredible obfuscation. And he determined and shows in a detailed analysis how the second gun theory falls apart. So without the second gun, everything else Metro says falls apart. So the bottom line is it was a massive cover-up. And I said, well, why would they bother covering it up? The guy made a mistake. That's bad enough. My son is still dead. Why would they cover it up? Locals here, Jim can, can verify this, it's what Metro always does. They always cover it up in order to protect crooked oh, cops and, and oh, an incredible up, corrupt system. Say again, Jim? I said it's not like they just covered this one up. It's standard operating oh. procedure across the board. That's just how That's they handle exactly the right. situation. It's it's a, and in Eric's case he was he was killed in the summer of 2010, as Jim said, July 10th, 2010. Just happened to be an election year, and the good sheriff Doug Gillespie was running for re-election in a very tight race. They'd already had one egregious killing, Trayvon Cole, like three weeks before. Gillespie's poll numbers were falling like the proverbial rock. So here's another screw up by his cops. They couldn't handle it. Costco couldn't handle the liability. The two together conspired to get rid of the video data because they were both going down, and Gillespie would never get reelected. So they protected a crooked killer cop, Bill Mosier, who had killed before. He'd only been on the force five years and had two murders, two killings on his hand, both of them extremely questionable. And, but Gillespie didn't really care about that. He just had to get reelected. Why? Because the big money that runs the Strip uses the cops in Las Vegas 
as the enforcers. So, so in a nutshell, that's what happened. And the main reason I think we're talking is I'm in town now to launch a fiction book based on the actual events of Eric's murder by cop. It's called The Permit. And why the permit? Because Eric was carrying uh, a weapon with a legal concealed carry permit. But on the other side of the fence, the cops, especially in Vegas, have a license to kill. It is their permit. And uh, so this this is a techno thriller. And where, where are you going to be know, first, the, off, Bill? Before we get into the uh, a synopsis of the book, where are you going to be on Saturday and what time? You bet. I'll be at the gun store on Saturday, the 13th, uh, from 11 to 1, 11 a.m. to 1 p.m., and that's on East Tropicana. And uh, I'll be signing copies of the permit there, but more importantly, perhaps, I'll be giving away a free signed copy of the book to the family of every single Metro officer-involved shooting victim. And if they all showed up, as you know, Jim, including you, I would have to give away more than 300 books. I don't think they will. I have 200 of them here, and I will give away one to every single shooting victim. It's just a way of of keeping Eric's memory alive, telling the truth. Yes, it's wrapped in fiction. I don't distinguish what is fiction and what is real. I leave that up to the reader. But uh, whenever you want, Jim, I'll give you a synopsis of the book. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this this is all the theme of the book. A Department of Homeland Security intelligence team has identified a new, incredibly dangerous terrorist cartel. It constitutes the most serious domestic threat to national security the U.S. has faced since 9-11. In the past decade, it has killed more Americans than al-Qaeda murdered on that day of modern infamy. These terrorists are deeply entrenched in our society. They look like us, talk like us, live in our neighborhoods, and for the most part, pass for respected citizens. But they have a virtual permit to kill, and thousands of Americans are dying. Their code name is Indigo. When three of these terrorists shoot and kill Eric Steele, a covert federal operative, they unleash dual avenging forces, Checkmate, a deadly black ops team, charged with assassinating sleeper cell terrorists on American soil, and Wind Steel, Eric's father and a former investigative journalist with close ties to the black world. The elder Steel is driven by grief and an overdeveloped sense of fairness and a determination to see justice done. But his ally, Checkmate, has a much larger mission, neutralize indigo with astounding high-tech weapons that instill fear, doubt, and division among the enemy, or America will erupt in armed rebellion and may not survive. So that's the overview it, it of, the, sounds, of the book. It sounds great, Bill. I uh, I can't wait to read it, actually. Um, <laughs> okay. If you're out there and you don't it, know where the gun store is at, um, it's on Tropicana between Eastern and Pecos. Uh, and, again, from 11 to 1, Bill's going to be there signing copies of the book. Come on by, get a copy of the book, come and meet Mr. Scott, and uh, maybe shoot a couple guns. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and uh, th- there are several real-world key premises of this this novel <clears throat> that I'm sure you especially can, can identify with, Jim. And uh, but the, one of them is, when mistakes are committed by scared, low intelligence, poorly trained public officials, there are deadly consequences. And they destroy thousands of lives. Those that are victims, victims, family members, and friends, uh, and, and often the killers themselves and their families. But another theme is that America literally is under siege right now, the real world, by an extremely dangerous new class of domestic terrorists. And that are these rogue or bad cops, and they are epidemic across the nation now. So when when uh, leaders, local, national, civic leaders, when they fail to control these guys, these terrorists, and they and force them to take responsibility for their crimes, if they don't, third-party entities, 
will step in and render justice. It can be everything from armed citizens rising up in rebellion to, as in the permit, it's a covert government agency that says in order to avoid chaos and anarchy in this country, they step in and they start taking out rogue cops. But but we do it in, in kind of novel ways, using high-tech methods. I use a robot dog that will shoot microwave beams from his eyes. Uh, also have little missiles with uh, you know, tiny missiles with a nanoparticle warhead that literally liquefies tissue. And uh, we we have a few other novel means. Several cops. And so I know you've got a very extensive uh, military scientific background. How uh, how yep. much reality is there to some of those uh, weapons? I mean, how uh, close to prototype or development are they on those things? Many of them are very very real weapons. <clears throat> There's one weapon, a microwave or excuse me, electromagnetic device that radiates that can disrupt the rhythms of a, of a human heart. So you can literally trigger heart attacks and strokes from a distance. And so that one and any number of other of these devices are real. Now, some of them I can't verify they're real, Jim, but as a reporter for Aviation Week, Space Technology Magazine for 22 years, I came across a lot of these. Some of them I was able to prove. We wrote stories about them in the magazine. An awful lot of them that I used in this book I was unable to cross-check and prove just because they were in the black world, the super highly classified uh, world of science, technology, and operations, you know. They call it the black world because they won't even acknowledge they exist. Well, I was unable to prove them to uh, to the standard of um, credibility, if you will, to get them in the magazine. But they're in my files, so I just pulled them out, put them in these fiction books. So... That's a long way of saying I think an awful lot of these are real. Uh, are they deployed yet? Don't know. If they are, they're in the black world only. Well, believe me, Bill, our, uh, our audience here on the roundtable group uh, can read between the lines. Okay, good. Well, you know, what, what message do I want to send with this permit, and why did I write it? Well, I wrote it for a number of reasons, because in my research, after Eric was killed, I could not believe the level and depth of corruption in this city, Las Vegas. And, and and many of the public officials are wired together, the different agencies. The cops are wired tightly with the district attorney. So the district attorney's job is to make sure the killer cops get off. And he does a very good job of it around here. But they're also the former to the attorney is now the head of the police union. That was my next leg or the yeah. cartel of corruption table, if you will, is a police union. Extremely venal. They do not support, I mean, uh, they're, they're part of the cartel. Then you have the public They didn't like Lori Bish. Uh, Lori Bish was controlled opposition. <laughs> Lori Bish yep. told me to my face uh, that there was no corruption in the department. Really? Uh, yeah. When, when okay. I was talking with her at uh, Winchell's, and where else do you meet a cop, but at Winchell's, uh, about uh, actually about uh, Eric's killing and about Trayvon, uh, we were talking about both of those, and there was no corruption, there was no uh, sinister or anything in the department. They were just mistakes that couldn't be allowed to happen again. But she would give me no specifics on what she would do to prevent them from ever happening again. Well, let me, let, let me just wrap up my part, Jim, with a few of the messages that I would like readers to take away from the permit. <clears throat> Number one. There's no accounting, there's no escaping accountability and justice. Even though this smug cartel of corruption believe, and they they really believe, they control every office and every public official, from the sheriffs, police chiefs, street cops, district attorneys, public administrators, public employee, union bosses, but they cannot escape the fury of honest citizens that are backed by shadow warriors. And that's the theme, one of the themes of the book. The other one is, that these corrupt officials, they will be held accountable uh, in ways they can't conceive. They're administered by forces they know nothing about, using weapons beyond their comprehension. So in the permit, the real message delivered to these new domestic terrorists is, is, is this. You kill, you lie, you die. And that term is used in the book. 
So there's no escape for these killers. They hide behind wealth, power, and of course the uh, the veil of corrupt officialdom, if you will. But the shadow warriors, the shadow warriors of justice, they're they're already in the midst of these heartless killers, and they're waiting. So there are other cops, they're federal agents, and there are three-letter organizations out there. And if all else fails, it falls to the citizens to arm themselves and take care of it. I do not. I do not uh, condone anybody going out and killing cops. I'm just saying, as a reporter, as an author, I read, and that's been my job for years, read the sense of the public. The public is outraged by senseless killings like that of my son, like a dog in Hawthorne, like a stupid cop running over a dog here in, in Las Vegas on May 21st, just wantonly killed him. And, and people are just totally outraged by it. All it's going to take is one incident. It could have been an incident much like Eric's. If the time is right, the frustration levels are high enough in the right community, people will arm themselves and start cop hunting. And I say that only for one purpose, to warn people like Stupid Gillespie and Chris Collins and Captain Cover himself, Captain Patrick Neville, former head of homicide. He's now back in the spook world of Intel here in Las Vegas. But there's many, many others. The police chief and some of his killer cops in Austin, Texas, they're doing the same thing. And, of course, there's the famous, uh, infamous New Orleans, one of the worst, most corrupt police forces in the nation, but also in Seattle, Atlanta. They're everywhere. If they do not take action, to get rid of their killer costs, to clean up their organizations, to get back to a true serve and protect mentality, uh, attitude, and culture, then the citizens will revolt. I don't want to see that happen because I don't want to see my country devolve into outright anarchy. But right now, the most threatening domestic terrorist threats in this country right now are rogue, bad cops, and there's far too many of them. Well, thank you, Bill. I know you've got a very busy uh, media schedule this this week, and uh, I I thank you for taking the time to to come on the show here. And uh, again, I want to put out there 11 to 1 on Saturday at uh, the gun store on Tropicana between uh, Pecos and Eastern. 11 to 1, come on out, uh, get a signed hardcover copy of the permit by Bill Scott. Well, thank you very much, Jim. I always appreciate the chance to talk to you and your uh, your listeners. Now let me reread the Las Vegas Review Journal's lie. Police who had been alerted by a Costco employee that Scott was causing a disturbance and had a gun said when officers arrived and told Scott to surrender, he raised a gun toward them. Obviously, the facts do not matter. The only thing that matters is perpetuating the lies of the Gestapo regime. And the fact that lamestream media continues to perpetuate these lies with complete disregard for the memory of the deceased loved one, I should say the murdered loved one, without any regard for the families that this is affecting, is deplorable. It's heinous. It's immoral, I find it to be utterly disgusting. And what I've learned from following this tragedy is never to believe what lamestream media tells us, to critically think about every single aspect of their reporting, and to always, always question everything the point completely not important to get children to read children who want to read are going to read kids who want to learn to read are going to learn to read much more important to teach children to question what they read children should be taught to question everything to question everything they read everything they hear children should be taught to question authority parents never teach their children to question authority because parents are authority figures themselves. kids have to be warned that there's bullshit coming down the road that's the biggest thing you can do for a kid. Tell them what life in this country is about. It's about a whole lot of bullshit that needs to be detected and avoided.
Mm-hmm.